This is the Human Action Podcast, where we debunk the economic, political, and even cultural myths of the days. Here's your host, Dr. Bob Murphy. Hey everybody, Bob Murphy here once again. Welcome back to another episode of the Human Action Podcast. Today I'm going to be going solo, addressing the very important, to some people, including myself, issue of what did Ludwig von Mises think about fractional reserve banking? All right, so if you're not familiar with this, there is a raging controversy, probably the single biggest thing that self-described Austrians like to argue about is whether fractional reserve banking, number one, is fraudulent or not, and number two, whether it destabilizes the economy. And so in these debates, often one of the minor points that people argue about is, hey, what did Mises himself think about this stuff? And both sides, as may not surprise you, try to argue at various points that, oh yeah, Mises was with us on this. So just further evidence that we're right and you guys are wrong. So that's what I'm going to talk about in this episode. Let me say at the outset, I am going to strive to be fair in this, meaning even people like George Selgin and Larry White, who are on the opposite side of this debate from myself and a lot of other people associated with the Mises Institute, um, I hope that what I say in this episode, they could agree that I didn't say anything false, right? They might say, oh, he left out X, Y, Z. I can't control for that. But I would like to believe that what I'm going to say to you now is non-controversial. Okay. So before I dive in, let me make sure I'm not leaving anybody behind. What I mean by fractional reserve banking, and by the way, this, this is very important, right? I think this issue is at the heart of Ludwig von Mises' theory of what causes the boom-bust cycle in market economies, all right? So this isn't that we're just arguing over some doctrinaire point and it doesn't matter one way or the other. Like, this really is critical. And so um, that's why I think it's worth going into these debates. So fractional reserve banking means that if people deposit money at a commercial bank, and it's what's known as a demand deposit. So it goes into, think of it like a checking account where the people believe at a moment's notice, they can withdraw the money from the bank or you know an ATM or a different branch of the bank. It doesn't have to be the same location that they deposited the money, of course, because money's fungible. But if that's what the people think they're getting, that it's not that they're buying a certificate of deposit, for example, or it's not that they're putting their money into a savings account that explicitly says you have to leave your money in here for at least six months or something like that. But no, they're putting their money into a checking account for the convenience to be able to say, I don't want to walk around town carrying a thousand dollars of currency on me or two ounces of gold coins, if we're if that's the money in this society we're envisioning. But instead I want to put it into the safety of a bank vault and then have the convenience to be able to write checks on it or to use my debit card or what other method of modern payments they come up with. Maybe it's something, you know, scans my thumb and that's how I authorize that it's me and I can transfer funds and so forth. But regardless of that, the point is if that's what you're doing with the bank, the question then becomes what does the bank do with the reserves? Right, So it's taking your money and money from other people, putting it in the vault, and then how much does the community think it has available on demand that it could withdraw at a moment's notice or that it could you know, write a check on or so forth, okay? And so uh, the position of 100% reserves says that the bank's dollar for dollar, if we're talking about dollars or ounce for ounce, if we're talking about gold coins or euro for euro, obviously if you're in the eurozone, says that the commercial banks in their vaults have enough money, actual money, you know, the legal tender money to be able to satisfy any redemption requests immediately. In contrast, if you have what's called fractional reserve banking, it just means, as the name suggests, that the banks only have a fraction of reserves on hand at any given time. And so if the banks practice fractional reserve banking, 
it allows for the possibility of a bank run, right? And we're all familiar with that, that if the community becomes alarmed and people, if too many people go to the bank to get, quote, their money out, the bank doesn't have it. Okay, but I'm just underscoring, keep in mind, the only reason that's a danger or a possibility is if the banks are engaging in fractional reserve banking. If they had 100% reserves that you went, you put $200 of cash, like actual currency, green pieces of paper in the United States, into the bank, and they literally just held it in a vault, then it wouldn't matter if you just showed up and said, I want to take all my money out. They said, here you go. We've, we've kept it here for you. Just like if you put your excess, you, if you put your winter clothes and things like that into a storage unit during the summer months, like if you lived in a small apartment and you couldn't keep all your stuff on you and you had a little storage unit down the street and you kept all your winter clothes and your skis and snowmobile and all that kind of stuff in the storage unit. And then when summer you know passes and then it's getting colder, then you go to get your stuff out. It's not that the people running the storage unit would say, oh yes, during any given day, if five or 10% of our customers show up and want access to their stuff, that's fine. But if 50% of our customers showed up and tried to take all their stuff out, we'd be in trouble because we've lent out a lot of the equipment to the community. Like that's how our business works. The people keep their stuff in our, in our uh, storage units and then we rent it out to other people. And that's how we stay. That's how we keep prices low right? That that's just not how that business is supposed to work. And you would be outraged, right? And so notice because with storage units, the owner is, is not renting your stuff out to other people. The way that business works is they charge you the amount they need to, you know, (laughs) cover their costs of the real estate and whatnot and the security. And that means, though, because the business model works that way, that it doesn't matter if everybody shows up. I mean, the, the owners might be unhappy because then they're going to go out of business in the sense of we lost all of our revenue if, if everyone takes all their stuff out. But the idea is, no, if people just show up and take a bunch of their stuff out, but they keep the units rented, the owners don't care, right? So I'm just underscoring. One more point. I have been at a presentation where a grad student got up and to give a Rothbardian uh, exposition on this point, you know, that the kid's paper was about Rothbard's view of banking. And in the opening remarks, the student explained to the faculty, and we are all sitting around a table, of what Rothbard's views on fractional reserve banking were. And when one of the faculty members, who was, who was not an Austrian, so, you know, in case you're trying to triangulate and figure out who's Bob talking about, it's, it's not someone obvious that you would know. Um, but one of the faculty, but this person was a good economist, was sitting there and heard this. And then when he realized, so I'm not spoiling too much by saying it was a man. That doesn't really narrow it down too much, does it? When he realized that, oh, this guy, Murray Rothbard, didn't think banks should be able to engage in fractional reserve banking, he turned to the guy that was left and kind of under his breath said, doesn't this Rothbard guy know how banking works? Right, so so much are modern economists steeped in the idea that fractional reserve banking is essential for banking to even work. Like that's just the only way it can work. That's wrong. All right, you could have a hundred percent reserve banking, and the way it would work is the bank would have to charge a fee. Right, so you go and put your money on the just like with a storage unit. Right, it's not that. Well, gee, if the owners of the storage units aren't allowed to take your mountain bike and rent it out to people, then you know how 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 could the storage unit work as a business? How are they able to pay for it? Well, because they charge you. That's why they're providing this very convenient service, and so they charge for it. And likewise, commercial banking just providing checking accounts and having ATMs and a network of point of sale terminals all over the place where you just go into the store and take out your bank card and swipe it. And then they give you groceries and the bank just keeps track of how much money you have in your account and all that stuff. That's very convenient. And so rather than having to rely purely on carrying cash, people would pay for that. Okay. And so, you know, we don't have to get into how would they do it? Would it be just a flat monthly fee? Would it be a percentage of your transactions, perhaps up to a ceiling. Who knows? That's stuff for the market to determine. But 
The point is you could have 100% reserve banking. It's not that that would be impossible, all right? So having said all these uh, introductory remarks, let me now move into more of the meat. What Rothbard's view is, just to summarize it very quickly, he thinks fractional reserve banking is fraudulent and he thinks it destabilizes the economy, that it causes the boom-bust cycle. And so just very quickly, why does he think it's fraudulent? What, what does that mean? Well, because if you're depositing, let's say, 100 U.S. dollars in currency, you know, five $20 bills, let's say you put that in your checking account, you go to the bank teller, you hand it over, the bank is now saying that you have on deposit 100 extra dollars, and you think that that's your money, that you, you have the ability to spend that at any time. It's not that you're thinking you lent the bank $100. You think that, no, they're holding it on my behalf. It's just a matter of convenience and safekeeping and so forth. And then the bank takes $80 and goes and lends it out to somebody else. Well, Rothbard thinks there's a mismatch there. And that, yes, you could survey the people making the deposits and they probably do know in some abstract intellectual sense that I know the bank's not literally just taking all of our dollars and putting them in the vault. That, you know, the bank, especially if they're paying me a very small interest rate on my checking account, clearly the bank's got to be putting my money to work is the phrase they might use. But still, I think Rothbard would say, people do have this idea that, no, my money really is there, that they still treat IOUs from Bank of America and Citibank and so forth as being virtually equivalent to money itself. And that if, in a sense, Bank of America technically, legally speaking, owes me $100, in the, I can go out in the community and transfer that IOU from Bank of America to some other merchant, right? Because that's technically what's happening. If I put $100 into my Bank of America checking account and they lend 80 of it to somebody else, and I go to the store and I buy $100 worth of groceries and use my debit card, what's happened there is technically Bank of America, instead of owing me 100 now owes the grocery store 100 And the fact is that the grocery store is not going to say, okay, well, here's your groceries. We total it up. If you pay us in cash, you owe us $100, right? If you paid with green pieces of paper. But if you try to pay with... IOUs issued from Bank of America, we're going to have to charge you 105 because, you know, that's not really the same thing. And we know technically Bank of America could fail. And so we would, it'd be better to have five $20 bills rather than Bank of America saying we owe you $100. And hey, chances are, if you showed up on any given Tuesday, we could give it to you if you wanted it, that that's not the same thing as the five $20 bills. And so that's why we're going to charge you. No, they don't do that. They they trade at par, right? In a typical business day, IOUs from Bank of America are interchangeable with the actual legal tender money in the United States, okay? And so Rothbard is saying because of that, there's a mismatch there and that, um, and, and you can tie back Huerto de Soto um, has a huge book on, this topic precisely going back to like Roman law and trying to show the different types of contracts you could have. And if people are storing their grain in a silo and what kind of contract is that? And just trying to trace it through and just showing that under old school principles of legal jurisprudence, um, modern fractional reserve banking is illegitimate. Okay. So that's, one aspect of Rothbard's view, but then he also thinks in a modern market economy, what causes the boom bust cycle? And he thinks it has to do with um, this practice of fractional reserve banking, where the banks, in a sense, issue more loans than there were genuine savings to back them up. I'm speaking loosely here. I don't know if Rothbard uses that exact terminology, but that's the idea. And so that makes the interest rate on those loans lower than it would have been 
had the banks only engaged in 100% reserve banking. So notice, that's another clarification I should probably make, commercial banks, even in a 100% reserve world, can still act as credit intermediaries, right? So there's like two main functions of banking. That on the one hand, they can just do the, provide the convenience of checking account services, just being as like storehouses, warehouses for your money. And they can act as credit intermediaries. So there, if somebody, you know, has access, a household has excess savings, they want to do something with it. And instead of them directly finding someone like a, a, a company they believe in and they invest in that company or they buy the debt issued by that company, instead they might say, you know what, we don't feel particularly qualified to vet all of these different organizations and individuals that want to borrow our money. So instead, we'll give it to the banker because they have people on staff that evaluate loan applications to the bank and we'll trust them. And so what we'll do is we'll buy a certificate of deposit from the bank. And so we give them $100 right now. We get this CD, certificate of deposit, that promises 12 months from now, we'll get $105 back, all right? So it's a 5% one-year CD. And so you could deploy your savings into those instruments, and then the bank clearly has your money for a year, right? It's not that if you change your mind next week, you can go get your $100 back, maybe with the, you know a little bit of interest that has accumulated or accrued in the week. That's, that's not the deal you've relinquished your command over that money for a year. You can try to sell the CD in the open market, but if interest rates have moved, you might not get your full principal back, okay? So just be aware of those distinctions. And so I'm saying banks can still engage in activities like that. And so households can buy long-term savings instruments issued by the banks, and then the banks can take the money they raised and lend it out to somebody else. And so banks can still perform as credit intermediaries and at the same time also offer 100% reserve checking accounts as another type of service to their customers. Okay, so just keep that in mind. So what Rothbard's view is in terms of the economic impact of fractured reserve banking is he's saying if you started out with an original scenario where the only loans that banks and other financial institutions could grant would have to correspond to genuine saving on the part of somebody else in the community, then the interest rate on those loans would accurately reflect the various time preferences and other considerations going into the intertemporal structure of production. Right, The interest rate there would be, quote, the correct price, showing the, the price of time or something, if you want to you know, speak somewhat metaphorically. In contrast, if we start out with that original scenario and now we said, let's give the banks the freedom to engage in fractional reserve banking. And so in addition to all the loans they're granting from money that was genuinely tied up, that, that the savers relinquished command over that cash and said, we realize we're selling present goods in exchange for future goods. We're going to give you money now. We don't have it anymore in exchange for your promise that you're going to give us money in the future, plus, you know, interest. Instead of that, people say, oh, here's my money. I still want to have command over it. I still want to be able to go to the store and swipe my debit card and get groceries right away. So I still think I'm able to use my money. But now the bank is going to take a large chunk of that and lend it out to somebody else. So they're using it too. And interest rates in order, so now that the banks seem to have more savings available, Right, If all the money that was in the vaults backing up 100% reserve checking accounts in the original scenario, now they take whatever, 90% of that and go lend that out to people too, well, interest rates have to come down, other things equal, because now they're trying to move a higher volume of loans. And so to get the community to be willing to borrow that much more from the banks, the, the price of borrowing has to come down. Again, other things equal, okay? So the point is, if the original scenario, when there was 100% reserves, if the interest rate structure in that system 
corresponded to genuine savings and helped the members of the market economy uh, coordinate their intertemporal production and consumption plans. So everything all meshed and it made sense. And there was a sustainable growth in the economy. Now, under the fractional reserve approach, interest rates are lower than they should be. There's, there seems to be more credit available. And so now businesses can borrow on cheaper terms. Certain projects that were unprofitable from a net present value perspective at the higher interest rate, now what, that interest rates are lower, certain long-term projects that involve a lot of capital investment, and you got to wait a while before the net income from the sales starts kicking in. Now those projects at the lower interest rate, a bunch of them appear profitable. And so the businesses say, oh, yes, I will borrow at this rate and go start this project. And so they start hiring workers and da, da, da. And then that's what the unsustainable boom is. And why is it unsustainable? Well, because the interest rates that were supposed to be guiding those intertemporal decisions were distorted. All right, and so that's Rothbard's sort of two-pronged approach to this. In contrast, the most famous representatives of what's called the free banking school, they say that, no, there's no problem with fractional reserve banking per se. So to be clear, all parties in this dispute that I'm summarizing dislike central banking. They don't want coercion from the political authorities in banking to establish a central bank and to you know, have it be a lender of last resort and all that stuff, okay? Also, they're all against state-issued fiat money, right? That they all agree the classical gold standard was a better system than once FDR went off and then Nixon finally killed the gold standard. And in general, um, I think they all agree that gold and silver would be an important type of commodity money if political coercion were taken out of the system. They might have different views about Bitcoin. And, you know, is that, what do you call that? Is that a commodity money or is that fiat money? You know, that's kind of a, an edge case that's a bit weird. But put that to the side. I think everything else I said, they would all agree with. Okay. But what Selgin and White say that is different is they say the problem with fractional reserve banking is not FRB, that's how you abbreviate it, per se. It's FRB in an environment where there's a central bank waiting in the wings and there's a lot of cartelization. There's not free entry into the banking sector, right? So if there's a lot of government regulation that prevents competition and new entrance into commercial banking and you've got this central bank that has the ability, if, if there's a fiat money standard, to just create new reserves out of thin air and is willing to act as a, quote, lender of last resort, well, then, yeah, that's bad because now the commercial banks have the incentive to uh, inflate more than they otherwise would, that they grant more loans, they push down interest rates below the level that would happen in a genuine, unfettered free market in banking. But Selgin and White say, just because we could all agree the outcome under that kind of a system is bad, doesn't mean if we got rid of the central bank and we just had the government, if there is going to be a government, if it just enforced the standard rules of contract and treated banks just like they treat pizza parlors in terms of, yeah, if you have contracts with people, you got to honor them. And if you made promises and you can't deliver, well, then you know your business gets liquidated and blah, blah. But other than that, we're not going to impose reserve requirements like as a separate legal rule on you, just like the government, uh, when it's regulating pizza parlors, doesn't come in and say, well, let's just make sure you have enough pepperoni on hand to make sure that in case there was a surge in demand for pepperoni pizzas that you wouldn't be caught flat foot. No, that's not, for all I know, that is what the regulations are. But <laughs> in a laissez-faire minarchist society, that's clearly not what the legal and you know court system would enforce upon pizza places. They wouldn't say that. They would say if somebody came in and paid money for a pepperoni pizza and you gave a pizza without pepperonis, then maybe that would be fraud or something. But they obviously would not micromanage 
the business decisions and the inventory decisions of pizza parlors in a laissez-faire, minarchist, night watchman state sort of environment, right? And so Selgin and White, that's the kind of system they favor as their first best approach. And they think in a genuine free market and banking, reserve ratios might be very low. Okay, so George Selgin debated me at the Soho Forum on this very issue, and he was quite proudly talking about how during the Scottish period of what's called free banking, that the banks kept very low reserve ratios, like 3% or lower during, in some periods. Okay, so we're not talking about 94 versus 92 or something. They're talking very low reserve ratios they think are consistent with a free market. And they also say, far from distorting the economy and spawning boom-bust cycles under a system of free banking, Selgin and White argue, the banks perform a vital service that if, for example, the demand for money goes up in the community because of population growth or whatever, it would be very wasteful, they argue, if the banks had to insist on 100% reserve policy because now if the community wants to hold more money, we have to go get more actual money, you know, the underlying base money from somewhere. So if like gold coins are the actual base money and then banks um, issue notes that are claims to redeem gold coins at any of their uh, branches, the community might be walking around and people would have a combination of gold coins in their pocket and banknotes that are claims to say, if you present this anywhere at this bank branch, you know, we'll give you one gold coin in return for this piece of paper. And of course, the, pay the bank notes would have to be hard to counterfeit and such, right, to make sure people weren't skimming out of the bank vaults that way, fraudulently. Okay, so if you had 100% reserves in a community like that, and then all of a sudden the demand to hold money goes up, you would get a combination of deflation, price deflation, right? So the prices of goods and services quoted in gold ounces or grains of gold or however they quote it would, would have downward pressure on it as people are trying to accumulate more money. And it would stimulate people to go mine more gold. And it would be the combination of those two things that would eventually restore equilibrium where, where the amount of purchasing power that people had in the form of their cash balances would have risen to the desired level, right? So getting more gold physically in circulation in people's pockets in the form of gold coins was one way, but also if prices came down, that means the existing stock of gold now can buy more in the marketplace. And so that when people want to hold more money because of uncertainty or whatever, or just population growth, Really, it's, it's purchasing power is what they really want, right? You might think like, oh, I want to have enough cash on hand that I could buy three days worth of groceries and stuff. Like maybe that's the way you're roughly approximating it, whatever. Or I could maybe you want to have enough cash on hand and or in your, in your bank account that even if my income shut off, I could still pay my basic expenses for two months. You know, maybe that's the way you're reasoning, okay? So notice there, the amount of money you need to have is partly based on what are the prices of the things you want to buy. And so that's how equilibrium would be restored in, in that situation. In contrast, if the banks are allowed to engage in fractional reserve banking, if the community wants to hold more gold money, they don't need to go dig up more gold. The banks can just issue more banknotes, that claim the presenter of this will get one ounce of gold upon demand. And so they can just issue more of those notes. And because in this scenario, we're supposing the community wants to add to their cash balances, that's not going to lead to more people showing up at the banks trying to pull out gold coins, right? It's precisely in this scenario when the banks can create more bank notes, thus lowering the reserve ratio and it's fine. There's not going to be any run on the bank and you know, no bank's going to get into trouble with too many people trying to turn in their notes and the bank's going to run out of gold coins in the vault. Okay? So that's the Selgin and White framework. And they're saying, notice in that kind of a system, 
that economizes on the resources we have to expend to go dig up more gold coins. So they think it's a neat innovation. It's a sense like we're economizing on the actual underlying physical gold. We're uh, simulating or synthesizing the services of the underlying gold commodity money, but economizing on how much gold we actually have to have devoted to that purpose. All right, so they think it's a great innovation. All right, so I'll stop there in terms of, I think I've done a decent job here summarizing the various views. So now, finally, you say, what does Mises have to say about this? So let me just motivate this in case you're wondering why am I talking about this? It's because this recently occurred. I'm not sure what made um, Larry White tweet this because he was referring to something that he was referring to an article in the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics that came out in 2023. But for whatever reason, somewhat recently, uh, Larry White tweeted this out. So if you're watching the video, I'll try to flash it on the screen. And he says, noteworthy, in the pages of the Mises Institute's House Journal, the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics, a Mises Institute author, Chris Maust Hansen, acknowledges that Mises was not a Rothbardian on fractional reserve banking as Mises saw benefits to fractional reserve banking. Okay, and then he, Larry has like a screenshot from this guy's 2023 QJ article where Mises does acknowledge this point that, yeah, in a community that uses gold as the underlying actual money, fractional reserve banking does allow for an economization on resources expended to get those coins that the co the community can in a sense have more gold coin services um, than having to actually go dig up the amount of gold to physically produce that many coins okay and then George Selgin um, retweeted that and says, yes, the article says that Mises and Adam Smith were wrong about the potential gains in economic growth from using fractionally backed fiduciary media to meet growth in the demand for real money balances. And guess what? Mises and Smith were right. Okay? So, again, here, if, if you weren't hip deep in this literature, you would think, reading White and Selgin, that Mises was totally on board with their position, all right? And so I'm saying things are a lot more nuanced than that. So what I'm going to do now in the remaining time is just go through some of the main points. I'm relying on two articles. One is from Joe Salerno, and one is my own article, all right? So my article is from 2019. It's called More Than Quibbles, Problems with the Theory and History of Fractional Reserve Free Banking. It's in the Corley Journal of Austrian Economics. And Joe's article is from 2012. The title is Ludwig von Mises as Currency School Free Banker, which is Chapter 5 in Guido Hulsman's edited collection, The Theory of Money and Fiduciary Media, Essays in Celebration of the Centennial. Okay, so what we refer to as Mises' book, The Theory of Money and Credit, came out in 1912. So then on the centennial of that in 2012, a bunch of Mises Institute people released a collection celebrating it, that milestone. And so Joe's essay was chapter five in that collection. Incidentally, the reason Guido's title here of the, of the collection is The Theory of Money and Fiduciary Media is because Guido argues that would be a more accurate translation. That you know, Mises obviously his 1912 book was written in German, and that historically that book when it was translated into English, the title they gave it was the Theory of Money and Credit. But Guido is saying, no. When you look at Mises, the actual terminology Mises uses, if you're familiar with his monetary and banking framework, really it would have been more accurate to to have the English title of that 1912 Mises book be. The Theory of Money and Fiduciary Media. Okay. So what I'm going to do is just spell out some of the main points here to show why 
Selgin and White's tweets there could be misleading. Also, let me mention, I'm not going to get into it now just because I'm looking at the clock and I've already taken too long to get to this point in the exposition. But I thought when I was participating in internet squabbles over the years when I was in grad school, so like early 2000s, uh, I had gotten the impression that it was only cranky Rothbardians that believed in 100% reserve banking. And that was a very narrow fringe view, again, that was just held by Murray Rothbard and his disciples. And I didn't invent that. People said that, okay? I'm not going to name names at this point, but there were people on the, let's call it the GMU side. So obviously there are Mises Institute affiliated scholars who are okay with fractional reserve banking, and possibly there are GMU-affiliated scholars who are 100% reservists, okay? So I'm not trying to say it's necessarily unanimous in both camps, but I'm speaking of generalities. And the person that I saw who would go around and when these debates would flare up would often try to stifle the debate and get people to move on to what he thought were more productive issues by just saying, guys, why are we listening to these internet Austrians? Let's just come on, there's this the scholarly work of people like Selgin and White on this, and then you got your internet Austrians spouting off about, you know, they're just sitting in their armchair trying to think about what does real uh, legitimate banking look like, and they're following, you know, Rothbard's their hero. And so right, and so I was stunned when I discovered later on that, no, there is a long-held tradition among various types of economists in favor of 100% reserve banking, all right, including the Chicago school, okay? People like Irving Fisher and so forth. Even real modern real business cycle theorists, right? There's a Prescott and Wessel 2016 piece that I refer to or cite in my article. So if you go to my More Than Quibbles article, that's what I do in the beginning is just to make sure everyone understands this is a very defensible position that has a, a a uh, high quality pedigree behind it. It's not just Murray Rothbard writing for a pop audience and then some quote internet Austrians who believe in this stuff. Okay. And it's not even just something that, oh yeah, back in the 1930s, some Chicago school of cut. No, it continues to this day. The 2022 Nobel laureates in economics, that was part of what they were doing is they, I saw them giving, or at least one of them, not Bernanke, the, it was either Diamond or Dibvig giving interviews to people, talking about how fractional reserve banking, he, he might have called it maturity mismatch or something like that, like the banks borrow short and lend long. Um, but how that leads to economic instability. And gee, should we have government policies to address that? That sort of thing. Okay, so this is still very much a relevant topic. So that's one thing I, that I get across there. But the critical thing is the way to make sense of the fact that Mises in his writings is clearly in favor of free banking, right? So he comes out unreservedly in favor of free banking. And so since guys like Selgin and White call themselves free bankers, it sure looks like, oh yeah, Mises is one of them. And the other thing is Mises never calls fractional reserve banking fraudulent, okay? And so, like I say, with Rothbard and his exposition, it's, it's some place, it's, it's not crystal clear what did Rothbard think the political coercive state should do in the meantime. Like, given that we have a state, should it have criminal penalties against commercial bankers if they engage in fractional reserve banking? That, I think, is a messier topic that I, off the top of my head, I don't know if Rothbard ever definitively wrote on that. But what's clear is he thought in a free society with like libertarian judges and so forth, that just standard contract enforcement would keep the banks practicing 100% reserves. Because if they didn't, they would just be like violating their contracts. It'd be fraud. Okay, so that's how Rothbard pictured it. 
So when you come to Mises, who's not an anarchist, clearly anything he's talking about will involve the state doing something. And so it's it's interesting. At some points in his writing, Mises clearly is in favor of free banking, but he also has explicit proposals where he wants the banks to be prohibited from issuing additional fiduciary media is the term he uses. Okay, so the idea is once you implement the reform, if the banks only have like, whatever, 10% reserves right now, that's fine. You just lock that in. But then going forward, if the banks are going to issue more deposits to people, those have to be backed up on the margin 100%. Right, so you lock in the reform today. Now going forward, if someone goes to the bank and deposits 100 US dollars in currency, you know, five $20 bills, that person's checking account goes up $100 and the bank's reserves in the vault, they take that cash and put it in the vault and keep it there. That's the idea. So that over time, the amount of backing goes up. All right, so that's what Mises view at certain places, that's the proposal he makes. All right. So it, I used to think when I was younger that Mises just, his views must have evolved on fractional reserve banking. Cause again, depending on what passage you're reading, if you're trying to say, does he agree with Selgin and white or does he agree with Rothbard? It looks like certain passages. Oh, he's clearly in this camp. And then other passages though, it looks like, Oh no, he's clearly in this camp. And so reading Salerno's piece really, crystallize what's going on here. All right, so here's the punchline. Mises was in favor of free banking. He didn't want the government to come in, at least in the passages where he's talking about being in favor of free banking. He didn't want the government to come in and to insist on particular reserve requirements for the commercial banks, like to say, hey, you got to keep at least 95% reserves or else we fine you and that sort of thing. He wasn't in favor of that, not because he thought, oh, that would unnecessarily tie the hands of the bankers and maybe the optimal efficient amount of fractional reserve banking, you know, maybe the reserve requirement should be as low as 8%. And so it would be really restrictive if the government came in and enacted a, a 90% reserve requirement or so. No, that wasn't his rationale. Mises' rationale was if we rely on the state to keep the bankers from issuing too much fiduciary media, fiduciary media, I realize I didn't define it, that's um, notes that are issued or deposits that are issued in excess of the reserves. Okay, so under 100% reserve banking, there is no fiduciary media, okay? So Mises thought, no, if we rely on the political authorities, including the central bank, to keep the banks having a high reserve ratio, whenever there's a crisis, especially like a war, that's all going to go out the window because the political authorities are going to lean on the banks to inflate, to allow them to be able to purchase munitions and draft soldiers and so forth and fund the war effort with ready finance. And so the way the, the state gets that is by having a very compliant inflationary banking system. And so Mises is saying it's be very foolish to turn to the state to try to keep the banks. I keep avoiding saying to keep them honest because then that brings in the fraud stuff, right? So, but to keep them with high reserve ratios. Instead of that, Mises says, let's just have free banking. Just uh, enforce normal rules of contract and property titles and so forth on the commercial banks, just like any other business. And so in particular, don't have a central bank acting as the lender of last resort. And then in that sort of a system, Mises argues, natural market forces would keep the reserve ratios relatively high. So he, he admits, even in that kind of a framework, banks could issue some fiduciary media, but he thinks it would be a pretty small problem. Okay. Now, I have never seen... Mises give a quantitative estimate as to what the reserve ratio would be in that kind of a system. Okay, so I, I think 
Joe Salerno and I imagine Mises thinks it would be like in the 90 plus percentile, whereas I think Selgin and White think that no, under a system of free banking, reserve ratios could be really low. Like I said, Selgin in the Soho Forum debate talked about how in Scotland it was 3% or less, and he wasn't alarmed. He, he thought that was like, yeah, see how this can work? So um, unfortunately, like I say, to my knowledge, Mises nowhere spelled out exactly what he thought in practice that would look like if people followed his advice. So we can't, I can't say there, but from other elements of his writing, to me, it's pretty clear he thinks it would be a pretty high percentage. Okay. Now let me just spend a, a bit more time here. Um, here, let me just back that, what I just claimed, let me justify that a little bit. So this is from Salerno's piece. I'll just read a little bit and then I'll explain what I did in my uh, article. So this is Salerno. Mises first discussed free banking in the final chapter of the theory of money and credit, which dealt with the problems of credit. Mises began the chapter by noting that since the time of the currency school, governments in Europe and the United States uh, recognized the need to restrict banks in their issue of fiduciary media in order to avoid economic crises. Following Great Britain, these governments adopted various legislative policies to restrict the issue of unbacked banknotes. After surveying these policies, Mises concluded, quote, None of these many systems of limiting the note circulation has proved ultimately capable of interposing an insurmountable obstacle in the way of further creation of fiduciary media. Okay, so notice right there, Mises is lamenting that, yeah, these policies, things like Peel's Act, if you're familiar with that, they didn't stop the banks, that none of them put an insurmountable obstacle in the way of further creation of fiduciary media. So wouldn't it be a weird way of expressing himself to talk like that if what Mises wanted was to give banks the flexibility to have reserve ratios as low as 3%. I don't think if that's what you thought the ideal outcome would be that you would say, ah, these attempts by these various um, political authorities to uh, limit fractured reserve banking, eh, none of them put an insurmountable obstacle in the way of further creation of fiduciary media. Right? That, that would be a weird way of speaking if what you wanted to do was to give them the flexibility, like I say, to have very low reserve ratios. Um, he also quotes Mises as saying, so long as the banks do not come to an agreement among themselves concerning the extension of credit, the circulation of fiduciary media can indeed be increased slowly, but it cannot be increased in a sweeping fashion. Okay, so there he was, what Mises was talking about is if the authorities just stay out of it and just allow for normal commercial transactions and enforcement of contract and so forth, he's saying, Mises is saying that, yeah, the banks um, maybe can slowly increase the amount of fiduciary media held by the public, but it can't be a rapid upswing. Okay, so here I'm not going to just read all the various quotes from Mises, but I just wanted you to understand that's Salerno's claim that when you do read Mises speaking favorably of free banking, it's because Mises thought that was the most effective check on fraction reserve banking, that it would be foolish to trust the authorities to do it with top-down regulation because the authorities would be precisely the ones that would relax those commands in a, in a crisis situation. Um, incidentally, I am working on... Here, here's the basic intuition. In a system of free banking where there's no special privileges, right? So there's no FDIC, there's no lender of last resort from the central bank, that sort of thing. There's no bailouts. Uh, but the banks have the legal ability to engage in fraction reserve banking, right? So let's say that kind of a framework. Still, any given bank has to be careful. If it expands too rapidly, right? So if all the other banks have, let's say, 80% reserves, and then one bank decides, you know what, let me live on the edge. Let's lower our reserve ratio to 50%. So in a sense, we're going to lend out more of the actual cash that we have in the vault relative to our peers. Now that bank's clientele 
are going to have more money to be to spend compared to the original scenario, right? Because now that that bank's customers just got more money lent to them. And remember, the original depositors still think they have as much money in the bank as they did before, right? That's the whole point of fraction reserve banking is, in a sense, for a given amount of money in the vault, it's like there's more than one person walking around thinking they have the ability to spend that immediately, okay? And so Mises' point is that bank's customers now are going to, in a sense, have like a trade deficit with the rest of the community. If we started out in an original equilibrium, now if one bank lowers its reserve ratio, makes more loans to its clients, as they go out in the community and spend and, and receive income, in general now, because they have higher cash balances going into it, they're probably going to end up spending more on net. And so that means whenever the banks get together and do clearinghouse operations and say, oh, your customers spent this amount for, you know, to my customers, but my customers spent this amount to your customers. What's the net difference? And then the banks settle up periodically and might have to transfer money in the vault from one bank to the other. The idea is if one bank aggressively engages in fraction reserve banking relative to its peers, its vaults will tend to run dry and go into the vaults of the other banks. Just like under a classical gold standard, if one country decides to inflate too much and print you know, France prints too many francs or, you know, Germany prints too many marks back before World War I when their, uh, their currencies were all tied to gold in terms of fi fixed weights. The, the negative feedback mechanism is, yeah, you can do that, but then that means gold is going to flow out of your bank's vaults into foreign countries' vaults. And so that was the check on that. So that was the mechanism that Mises thought would happen even domestically among banks um, within a given country if you just had free banking. So again, that doesn't tell us where, what reserve ratio would all the banks tend to land on. It wouldn't necessarily be 100%, but the point was, um, one way of looking at it, you might say, well, couldn't the banks all collude and just keep lowering the reserve ratio in unison? Okay, but then as long as there's free entry, you know, so let's say all the banks agree, hey, let's just all lower our reserve ratios to 50%. And then we won't have a net outflow of reserves because, you know, all of our customers will have the new money and the spending on average should cancel out and then we'll all make more money, profit, right? They could do that, but if there's free entry, now someone else can open up a brand new bank and have reserve ratios of 90%. And so, you know, maybe then the, the vault cash of the rest of the banks starts leaving and going into that. So you see how regulation, you know, extensive cartelization of the banking sector coupled with a central bank acting as lender of last resort, you can see how that encourages much lower reserve ratios than would be the case under a laissez-faire approach. Okay, last thing I will mention is what I do in my article after I, you know, give the pedigree for the 100% reserve position is I go through and show that you can get some insight into Mises' views on fractional reserve banking by looking at his placement of the boom-bust cycle in human action. And so rather than putting the theory of what causes the boom-bust cycle in the section of human action where Mises is talking about political interventions, right, where Mises talks about like minimum wage laws or rent control yeah, and things like I'm that, Twitter, that's not what Mises puts it. For instance, he uh, puts the theory also. of yeah, just what he calls the circulation credit theory of the trade cycle. He puts that in the pure economics, you know, of the of the free yeah, market section. Right, great pleasure, Bob. Thank you. And so that might surprise you at first because Rothbard doesn't do that. In Man, Economy, and State, when Rothbard spells out what we think of as the Austrian theory of the business cycle, that is in the part of the book where Rothbard's talking about now what happens if the state starts intervening. Then we leave, you know, the great blissful laissez-faire thing that we just talked about in the previous section. And now let's look at these distortions. And in there, the Austrian theory of the business cycle is one of the elements that he goes over. But again, Mises doesn't do that. And I think it's interesting to see why. Because Mises thinks in principle, even if you had gold commodity money, it is possible that if miners bring new gold to the surface and then that money enters the community via the banking system, 
right? So the, the miners are out there, they get a bunch of new gold, they come into town, and instead of like going to the saloon and just spending it there, which you might think, what if instead they go to the banks and they say, here's a bunch of new gold to deposit into my account, please? And then what if there's fractional reserve banking in that world? And then the banks, um, no, sorry, even if there's 100% reserve banking, excuse me, they, that's important. Even if there's 100% reserve banking, if the miners come in, deposit it, and, and they buy CDs, and now the the banks can lower interest rates. And the idea is if that new money hitting the system first distorts interest rates before it percolates out and then raises all weight, wages and prices quoted in gold ounces, Mises thinks that could set in motion a very small boom-bust cycle. So in practice, Mises thinks that's not a big deal in the grand scheme because at any given time, the amount of new gold mined is a small portion of the existing gold that already has been mined. And even of that, not all of it's going to first flow into the economy through the credit markets. You know, like I say, the, 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 the gold miners might spend it on all sorts of other stuff first besides just saving it. Okay. And so Mises thinks that in practice, this is a minor thing, but he does think theoretically it is important to understand that as economists. So my point is, once you understand, whether you agree with him or not, and some Rothbardians don't agree with Mises on that, but when you see that that's what his view is, now it's crystal clear why Mises says any amount of issuing new fiduciary media causes the boom-bust cycle. And I quote that in my, in my article as well, if you want to see that. To me, that's like the definitive quote. So big picture, I think it's crystal clear. Mises thinks any amount of fractional reserve banking, if it's issuing new amounts into the community, not just referring to stuff that you know happened 10 years ago and it's already worked its, its effects through, but newly issued fiduciary media, Mises thinks causes the unsustainable boom, which leads to a crash. He thinks, therefore, fractional reserve banking does need to be tamed. He thinks politically, at least in most of his writings, the best practical way to do that is just to have a policy of free banking, just treat banks like regular commercial enterprises that you have contract enforcement and stuff like that, but no special regulations, but also no special privileges, have open entry into it and so forth, and that that's the best way to, to limit it. And he also, though, just as an honest economist, acknowledges that the practice of fractional reserve banking does allow the community to economize on the resources expended for digging up more gold and stamping it into coins, for example. Okay, so those things can all be true simultaneously. It's not that Mises is, uh, you know, changing his view and he's flippant or whatever, or inconsistent. No, that's all a coherent thing, a, a, a coherent collection of policy views and uh, economic statements. Okay, so that's where I'll end here. Again, to really understand what I just went through this episode, you have to read Salerno's piece and mine. And so I'll link to those, of course, in the show notes page. All right, everybody. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Check back next week for a new episode of the Human Action Podcast. In the meantime, you can find more content like this on Mises.org.